Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, business, uh, Harvard Business Committee. I'd like to thank them for thinking of me. I'd like to thank my uh, family and friends for coming tonight to support me. I'd like to thank the Cleveland Cavaliers for adjusting their schedule so that <laughs> most, most of you could attend tonight. What you may not know, what you may not know about this award is that they don't exactly give it to you. What they do is they call you up and they ask, were you to be offered this award, would you be willing to accept it? <laughs> so when they said that, I figured I needed to do a little research. So I went back and I Googled Harvard, and that, that came up pretty good. <laughs> but then I had to do a little more research. And I determined that, in fact, Harvard had never beaten Notre Dame in football. <laughs> now, Notre Dame had lost to Yale in 1914, 27 to nothing, and on the theory that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, I decided this would work out. <laughs> the next call I made was to my mom. And I said, Mom, I'm going to win the Dively Award. And now my mom is very tuned in. She's into this. And she said, oh my gosh. She says, that is a very prestigious award. So we had Notre Dame and we had my mom. So, so far, <laughs> things were really good. The next thing, now, I don't know about your mom, but my mom has this habit. She will ask you a question, and she doesn't really intend that you answer it. What she <laughs> intends is that she's going to answer the question. <laughs> so she said to me, well, who do you think nominated you? Now, this wasn't a question I was supposed to answer. She said, <laughs> she knew the answer already. She said, well, it must have been one of those people you flew for free. <laughs> That's my mom. <laughs> so if you are on the committee and I didn't fly you for free, I owe you one. But <laughs> But then she asked one more question that she fully didn't expect me to answer. She said, well, what are you going to talk about? She said, well, you have to talk about at the early time when you worked out of the house, and you have to talk about how corporate wings grew, and you have to talk about when you flew all those famous people around, and you have to tell some stories about flight options, and don't forget those other companies that I can't remember, and don't forget to talk about your book. <laughs> so I said, well, Mom, that's going to take three hours. And she said, well, everybody will love it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I love you, Mom. Thanks. <laughs> now, now, my son had a different theory. My son said, <laughs> Dad, my chemistry class only lasts an hour. So I'm going to defer to my son, and we're not going to go longer than a chemistry class. Now, the introduction tonight by Mike, and I've been blessed to be a partner with Mike for 27 years. But I have to tell you, getting Mike recruited into this program wasn't always easy. Mike had his own accounting practice, and he was, uh, he was doing tax returns and all those really fun things. And I wanted him to come get passionate about aviation the way I was passionate about it. So after a couple of years of working together and him helping me out, I finally decided this was how I was going to convince him. I was going to put on the full recruit. So I tell him, Mike, we're going to grow this business. We're going to go ahead and we're going to do acquisitions. And I said, in fact, we're going to fly down on one of these private planes. We're going to fly down to Columbus and we're going to go look at an acquisition. I'm thinking, what more would a finance guy like to do than fly down and look at an acquisition? But I did make a mistake. I rented a Piper Aztec, which... <laughs> My aviation friends know this is a kind of a small little twin-engine airplane with six seats, no air conditioning, and in fact, to get into the back two seats, you have to go in through a baggage compartment, which is how Mike got into the plane. <laughs> what I didn't know was Mike doesn't really like to fly. Well, we flew down to Columbus, we flew back, and when Mike got out of the plane, he had that look that I can tell now, I see it in Mike, that, what do you mean this plane doesn't have air conditioning? So, I suffered for about three years from my attempt to recruit him, didn't work out so well. But then, I had another acquisition. So I got Mike, got an air-conditioned plane this time, and we flew down to Austin, Texas, to 
to acquire a company called Austin Business Jets. Now, this made a lot of sense to me because we were in Cleveland. Cleveland was declining in the middle 80s. The South was growing. They needed a good private aircraft service, so we were going to fly down to Austin, where we had a meeting with a company with a gentleman named Harold Kennedy, who was going to go ahead and sell this company to us. So we sat down. We talked about the business. We talked about what he thought the future of it was and so on, and I thought it was just going great. And then Mike asked a question. He said to him, could we see a copy of your financial statements? And Harold Kennedy said, well, we really don't have financial statements. That's not something we do a lot in Texas. <laughs> I got that no air conditioning look from Mike again. So now I try to convince Mike. I go, well, this isn't a problem. This is really important. This is a good company. We'll just get their bank statements, and we'll go ahead and we'll create our own financial statements from them. He still has that look on his face. So we go in, we kind of look at the company, and I convinced Mike that we ought to buy it. What we had found when we looked at it, that they actually had an insurance refund of about $130,000 that even they didn't know they were getting. So I convinced Mike, let's just buy this company. We'll give them $130,000 down. We'll give, them their, we'll give them their own money, and then we'll have an earn out. Mike goes, <laughs> all right. So I talk him into this. And now we walk into the Harold Kennedy's office, the seller of the business, and we said to him, we're prepared to offer you an earnout on this business and $130,000 up front. Harold Kennedy was so excited that he had a $130,000 business, no financial statements yet, that he insisted upon having his dinner at his house. So he was very grateful this was a big deal for him. He neglected to mention one thing. On his way to his house, it happened to be a Wednesday evening, and in Texas, on Wednesday evenings, they have Baptist revival meetings. So in order to close the deal, they insisted that we went to the Baptist revival. We sat there for two hours, and then we went to dinner afterwards. And even though the plane was air-conditioned coming home, Mike still had that look all the way home. <laughs> so I have a couple of theories with Mike. Always an air-conditioned plane and no Baptist revival meetings on any of the deals. And, and that's what's kept us together for 27 years. Now, Ed McDonald, who did the invocation, Ed's been with me for 26 years. Ed is the fixer in the company. Whenever we have problems in any of our companies, we always give Ed the toughest jobs. That's what he's good at. Well. Ed's down in Austin. Guess how that happened. <laughs> so Ed's down in Austin, and, and we're from Ohio. We weren't aware that in Texas they have this creditor's law. They have kind of a rule in Texas whereby if you owe somebody money and don't pay them, it's OK. <laughs> it's a little different than the laws we have in Ohio. But in any case, we had withheld an airplane because someone hadn't paid us. And we weren't going to return the airplane until we got paid in full. But apparently in Texas, that wasn't allowed. So we got sued, and we lost in, uh, I don't remember, uh, some, I, I don't know, Judge Billy Bob Stonewall Jackson or something like that. So he goes ahead. And now we have a judgment against us in Texas. So the only assets we have in Texas are the phone system, the, the furniture, and so on. So one day, Ed calls, and he says, Ken, you're not going to believe this. The sheriff's here. They're hauling out our furniture. <laughs> and since the phone is leased, I'm not going to be able to talk to you for too much longer, because they're going <laughs> to unplug the phone, and I'm going to not have any communications. And I said, well, Ed, what'd you tell the employees? He said, I told them Ken wants new furniture. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, so that's Ed. Now, my mom was right. And this business really did start in, my, in, in the bedroom at my home in South Euclid. My total overhead was $9.95, the Ohio Bell line that I had hooked up. And what I was attempting to do was I was attempting to sell corporate aircraft and to manage them on behalf of the people that we sold them to. And at this time, this is in 1980, and the cost of aircraft was a little bit different. But I'm on the phone, and I'm trying to sell one of the brand new jets that had come out. It was a $480,000 jet at the time. 
And I'm on the phone and I'm explaining. The jet is $480,000 and then you have to hire a pilot to fly the plane, that's $24,000 a year. You have to hire a co-pilot, that's $9,000 a year. I see my flight options people looking at me like I'm crazy. No, those were what we paid for pilots in those days. And then fuel was 30 cents a gallon, so you had to put fuel on the airplane. And so I'm all done. So when you're done with all those expenses, you can fly privately and have your own jet for about $100,000 a year. And as I hung up the phone, I looked behind me, and there was my father. And he looked at me. My father had worked for the government. He was a GS-13, and we lived in South Euclid. And my father looks at me, and he says, were you really talking to somebody, or are you just making this up? <laughs> I said, no, Dad, that's, you know, that's the business I'm getting into. He goes, let me understand. Your business is that you're going to charge people $100,000 a year to fly around? I said, yeah, that's it. He goes, you better go to law school. <laughs> he goes, because this thing has no chance. So it wasn't too long after that, though, that I called him up and I said, Dad, I've got a better idea now. There's actually a company called Corporate Wings. And what Corporate Wings does is Corporate Wings has a license to fly commercially for hire. It's been granted by the FAA. And I think I want to buy this company because it'll give me more things that I can sell when I go out to manage these companies. And my dad said, well, how much is the company? I said, well, it's $27,500. And he said, well, where are you going to get the money from? And I said, well, I think I've got this figured out. I said, the, the company has $27,000 in the bank, and I think as soon as I own it, I'll have the cash, and so then I'll just take the $27,000 out. And he said, well, where's the other 500 bucks coming from? I said, well, Dad, why do you think I'm calling you? <laughs> <laughs> so that was really, that was really how, um, that was really how Corporate Wings began. Now, I've often said that in any of the businesses that we have, one of the questions I'll always ask is I'll ask, what is the unique competitive advantage? And I think in order to make a business work, you always have to be able to answer that. So you have to answer it in very short term. What's the unique thing that this business does? Well, in 1981, the unique thing that we did was that, well, I have to take you back a little bit. There's really no credit cards, and we didn't have computers. So I know this is a hard time to, to re rewind to. But what we did at that point in time is we actually created a system that provided a point of sale accounting system for aircraft. Planes at that time, a company might have a plane, it'd go to Dallas, then it'd go to Los Angeles, it'd go to Lorex, fly all over the country. And since there wasn't credit cards, the bills would come in and the bills would flow in 60 days later, 90 days later, whatever. And so companies had a hard time accounting for what their airplanes were really costing them. And so it was during that period that we went ahead and we devised a system. And the system was relatively simple. In fact, when I thought about it and talking about it tonight, I'm, I can almost laugh. What we required was that each one of our pilots, when they bought gas or when they incurred an expense, they had to write it down. <laughs> this was the unique idea. This is the entrepreneur <laughs> idea that you can take home with you tonight. <laughs> so, what we would do then is we'd get a 14-column pad and we'd put all the expenses by what they were. We'd sum them up in total and we'd walk into the company, it's Parker, Hannafin, Acme, Cleveland. We'd walk in there at the end of the month and we would say, here's what your plane cost. And that was really how we grew the business during the, during the, during the, during the, the uh, 80s. Well, what happens with any competitive advantage, of course, is that people seek to emulate it and copy it. And so soon enough, our competitors were writing things down, and they found out where you bought the 14-column pad. So our advantage went away a little bit. By that time, we had upgraded to a 64K uh, data general computer. So we'd really, we'd really come around. So what we did move to next was we decided to start buying the real estate. We said if we would buy the underlying real estate or at least have access to and control the underlying real estate at an airport, that would prevent our competitors from coming into that airport. And so we began to grow by acquiring, the, these, uh, acquiring these, different, these, um, these different facilities. And then in the early 90s, the Gulf War came. And the Gulf War was really bad for aviation. The first Gulf War, fuel prices went up. People weren't as flying as much. And a lot of my owners, a lot of the owners that we managed airplanes for, were trying to find ways to get more revenue on their plane. So it was this time that we invented what was called the interchange. And an interchange was where you could buy one airplane 
and you could own it, but you didn't have to fly in that one. You could fly in someone else's. So if you wanted to put your airplane out for a long period of time, we could generate a lot of revenue. And what that eventually gave us is it gave us access to an aircraft for a period of time. Because heretofore, what people would do is they would charter a plane for a day, or they'd take it for a couple of days. But now we had airplanes that were available for a long period of time, six months, nine months, 12 months sometimes. And what that did was it put us into a different market. It allowed us to start selling aircraft, and I mean, start chartering aircraft out to, to uh, um, concert tours. So like we would, we would do the Elton John tour, we did Brian Adams, we did Bruce Springsteen. And so we got noted as if you needed a plane for a long period of time, you would call Corporate Wings and we would provide that for you. So one day an agent calls from Cincinnati and says to me, have you ever done politicians? And I said, well, we haven't, but, but we would. He said, well, I, I'd like a long-term lease. I'm thinking of 12 months or so. He said, on a, for, a, for someone who's running for president. I said, running for president? I said, who is it? He said, well, it's the governor of Arkansas. I said, the governor of Arkansas is running for president? <laughs> and, he, and he needs a plane for 14 months? <laughs> this guy's an optimist. And so I said, but he is going to have to pay in advance. And the deal I ended up cutting was I made a deal whereby he paid one month penalty up front, and then he paid for each month he used the plane. So my theory was the guy uses the plane for one month, we get paid for two, and it's a hell of a deal. Well, you know how that ended. <laughs> we flew him for 15 months, and we got paid for 16, so big deal. So that was really where, uh, where we were in the mid-'90s. It was kind of at that point in time, and as Mike pointed out, I've always had a passion for aviation, but I think it was in the mid-90s that we started to think that we could make this into a serious company. And it was at that time that we started thinking about how to create value, about how we could do things on the balance sheet side of the company to make it for the long term. By the way, when I first got into aviation, there were about um, 1,200 corporate jets that were flying, and by the mid-90s, there's roughly around 7,500 corporate jets that are flying, and today we're close to 18,000. So we were kind of involved in a, in, a, in a big part of the growth of the industry. So as we started to think about creating a serious company, we went out and we raised capital and the theory that we would use these, these uh, unique competitive advantages that we had to buy more real estate and to, and to, uh, and to grow the company. And in turning into a serious company, we started to do things like auditing the company all the time. Um, and we took all the Porsches off the books. We did those kinds of things. <laughs> and we went out and we raised capital. And it was at that time that we were watching our business start to become uh, degraded a little bit because this concept of fractional ownership had appeared. Now, fractional ownership is kind of the equivalent of a timeshare condominium. And up until this point, people were really either renting airplanes by taking them for one night, like, you, like the corollary, like a hotel room for a night, or they just buy the whole plane like a vacation home. So this timeshare, this kind of where you bought a piece of a plane, was in the middle. And the advantage of it was that you could have planes all over the United States. And so our charter market was being degraded because fractional ownership was taking away some of these clients from us. So I walked into the boardroom. I say, Mike and I walked into the boardroom. And we explained to them how we saw in the long term where this real estate thing wasn't enough. We needed to be able to compete on the fractional basis. And they said, well, look, it's nice that you think that way. Why don't you spend a little money and investigate it, but don't get carried away. I want you to still stay focused on, the fra on, on, on growing the real estate and buying and growing the business that way. So we went out and we explored, and we developed the concept of having a used aircraft. The concept of fractional ownership was traditionally in new aircraft, and it was in new aircraft because in the early 90s, manufacturers had overproduced aircraft. And when they couldn't sell them, they would park them on a ramp and they would be, they would call, they'd call them whitetails because they'd have no registration number on them. And when the concept of fractional ownership came up, certain companies would get these whitetails on consignment. And that was really where our competition was, but they were all brand new. Our vision was that you could buy an, a used aircraft, or we used to call them previously, no, we just do call them previously enjoyed aircraft. And you would buy them, because aircraft depreciate like cars, you could buy them at 50, 40 cents over, below what their new prices were. So we said we will just buy used aircraft, and we'll go out and we'll put them into the fractional ownership business. That was our concept. Now, 
one of the key things you need to do to do that is you can't have just one plane. Because if someone thinks I'm going to buy an eighth or a fourth of a plane, they have to see at least four or eight planes. They don't want to see just one airplane because they, they, they want to know there's enough capacity there. So we had to go out and we had to get financing for this. Now we had about six million dollars in cash in the bank at this time. And we went out and Mike and I, it seems like we talked to a thousand banks, but we probably talked to 15. And the idea was, we'd like you to loan money against these pre-owned aircraft. And what we're going to do is we're going to sell pieces of them off. And then eventually, when they're all sold off, you'll get your money back. And the banks looked at us, and they were like, so let me understand this. <laughs> you sell three quarters of the plane, and then we own a quarter. Which quarter do we own? We own the right wing, the left wing, we own the empennage. So they weren't real enthused about that. And I can sell pretty good, but that one was a tough one. So, after visiting all these banks, we, had, we felt, thought we needed about $30 million of debt to be able to buy all these airplanes. And in fact, with $6 million in cash, we were able to borrow $12 million in debt. So we were way behind where we thought we wanted to be. Well, in June of 1998, Warren Buffett buys our biggest competitor, which is a company called NetJets. And he buys them for $700 million. And I got to tell you, 12 of the 15 banks immediately called back, loved our proposal, <laughs> were glad to get involved, and by the end of that summer, we had $175 million of debt capital, same $6 million in the bank. So being at the right place in the right time helped us a lot in, in doing that. So I go back to the board. We, actually, we, we, we take the process. We, at that time, we started, we, we, uh, we started to, to uh, work on the used aircraft process on the program, and we went live in October 13th, 1998. And by March of 1999, revenues were $100 million. We were about a $40 million company before then, and we did $100 million in revenue in those first five and a half months just on that product alone. So I went back to the board and they said, well, what are you wasting your time on all this real estate stuff? Get focused on the <laughs> fractional business, and that's where we, you know, that's clearly where the growth is. So, so that's what we went ahead and did. In 2000, the business was growing so fast, it grew to somewhere between 300 and 400 million. Well, I'll get back to why we're not sure whether it was 300 or 400 million in a minute. But what our, what our board decided at that time was that we ought to do an initial public offering, that we had this great growth, that we were hitting the market at exactly the right time, and so we prepared to do an IPO. This is in 2000. As we were doing, going through the IPO, the reason that we were unsure about what, a, what our revenues were was that there was a little dispute among the SEC and our auditors about how you recognize revenue in this business. Do we recognize it when we sell the plane, or do you recognize it as over a five-year contract? And what that did was it held up the IPO, and then we had the dot-com that bombed in 2000, and so then we could no longer go public. In later that year, of course, once bankers have you, once bankers are interested in you, they don't let you go. So the bankers proposed that we would merge with a division of Raytheon called Travelair. This was a company that was about our size. They were losing about $30 million a year at a time when we were making 12. So the concept was we'd put these two companies together. We would eliminate the synergies. We'd synergize the companies. We'd eliminate the overhead. And then we'd go ahead and have a much more profitable company. The way we did that was Raytheon owned 49% of the company, and the original flight options owned 51% of the company. Raytheon never wanted to be in the fractional business. They were glad to get rid of this lost loser. And we engaged in a um, process whereby we would buy them out. We had to buy them out within nine months. In that nine-month period, we went off to financial sponsors. We found out what the market was worth. And there was a little clause that was, sometimes it's referred to as shareholders roulette. But there was this clause whereby we had to offer them a price. And they could either accept that price, or they could, or they could reject it, and then they'd have to buy us out. And the theory was that we, we could go in and say, look, your 49% is worth $10, and we're prepared to write the check now. So they wanted something to keep us honest, to say that we, they could buy us at the price we offered them. So after, about, after, after the nine months went by, and we'd synergize the companies and put them together, lo and behold, we go in and we offer them $180 million for their 49%. At which point, Raytheon turns around and says, that's too little. That's not enough. <laughs> we had made the company so good that they decided they wanted to keep it. And for someone who was passionate about aviation, 
and who thought he was building a great company. It really was a very difficult time. And I remember calling a, a good friend of mine, Mal Mixon. And I said to Mal, I said, Mal, this is what's going on. And I can't believe I offer more money. And, Ken, and, and, and Mal said to me, Ken, take the money. He said, you'll be able to buy the company back at 50 cents on the dollar. Well, Mal was wrong. We bought the company back for 10 cents on the dollar. <laughs> and after, after that evolved is when Mike and I began directional capital, where we started to use our expertise in private aviation. And we, tried to, we, we started to use it to invest only in an area that we knew about. So as opposed to kind of being an expert on, or investing in a bunch of different areas, we began to be an expert in the one area we knew, and that was private aviation. And that's what directional capital did. Now, the unique competitive advantage we created at directional capital was that you could never hire us as an expert. Today, if you want to do something, and we have partnerships today with the Carlisle Group, we've done them with Allied Capital, Resilience. We have partnerships with many private equity firms, but you can never hire us to be your expert. We'll look at anything you want to invest in for free, but the rule is that we get to co-invest. So if ultimately you want to go forward and make that investment, we either co-invest with them, or in the case that it's something we like and you don't, we can go ahead and do the investment on our own. And so that's really the company that we are in today, and that's really the, the investments that we've made and the different entities we're in. Now, I, don't, I want to close tonight by, uh, in December of, uh, I'm sorry, in, in November of 2002, I was invited to a uh, dinner party at former President Clinton's um, office in Harlem. It was a very small party. And the president, I was sitting at a table, eight, eight or nine people, the president was there, and this is dinner conversation. This is nobody given any political speeches, but this was still in December of, or uh, November of 2002. The, the uh, Democrats had just been swiped, they, they'd lost a bunch of seats. They had really been creamed in those interim elections in 2002. So to make dinner conversation, I said to, I said to the president, well, what do you think happened? And he said to me, to be a successful politician, you only have to do four things. Agree, defend, attack, and propose. Well, when someone who's very, been very successful in an area tells you the only four, there's only four things you have to do to be successful, he had my attention. Now, his theory would have been that in 2002, the Democrats had to say, we agree that terrorism is a horrible thing and that we defend. Every time this country's been under attack from World War II to Korea, it's been the Democrats that have defended it. And we have to, we have to attack. If you allow the Republicans to take over, it'll be like Nixon during, the, during uh, Vietnam. And then you would propose what it is you want to do. So those were his four things of his success. So I want to close here tonight with my four things. Number one, in all of our businesses, we've tried to know what it is that's our unique competitive advantage. So we want to know today what it is that distinguishes this business. You have to be able to tell me in one or two sentences, what is it the thing that you do that other people don't do? If you can't answer that question, then you only have one choice, you cut costs, until you figure out what the competitive advantage is. <laughs> Number two is that we model all of our businesses and know what drives them. Now, I don't mean financial money, I mean, I mean financial money, but not financial statements, because if you look at businesses over a long period of time, you come to realize that the financial statement never really tells the story about the business. It doesn't tell you what the competitive advantage that the business has. It doesn't tell you about its patents. It doesn't tell you about what's R&D and what's under, develop, under development. We would look in 2004, 5, and 6, we would be trying to buy these aviation fueling companies. And inevitably, all their top line revenues, which was really fuel sales, was going up. But of course, you could never tell by just looking at the financial statements, were they going up because the company was growing, or was it just merely because the price of oil was going up? So we figure out what the drivers are in all of our businesses, and then we, and we model according to those drivers. And then, once you know what those drivers are, then you measure them. I've often said that if I stand outside of my office, uh, if I stand at the entrance to the office, and I have a clipboard in my hand, and everybody that comes in who wears a pink shirt, I put a check mark and I smile. I, I'll tell you what, by the end of the week, people will be wearing pink shirts and no one will know why. <laughs> because and they'll know just because it makes me smile. So whatever, whatever you measure in a business, whatever you decide to measure is what people are going to be able to be focused on. And finally, number four is that surround yourself with people that you trust and do a good job. 
It's no more complicated than that. I say there's four kinds of people that end up working for you. There's people you don't trust, and they don't do a good job. And why you keep them longer, you shouldn't keep them more than three minutes after you figure out who they are. There's people you don't trust, but they do do a good job. And if that's the employee, then what you do is you buy my book, and you figure out how to go ahead and turn them into trusting individuals. <laughs> then there's people that you can trust, but they really don't do a good job. Well, that's what relatives and family and friends are for. <laughs> And then there's the people you trust, and they really do a good job. And I've been surrounded by those kind of people, and I want to ask them to stand up at this point in time. Bob Sullivan, nine years. Jay Hubline, 10 years. Joe Salata, 10 years. Mike Silvestro, 10 years. Steve Maiden, 11 years. Stay standing. <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> Darnell Martins, 12 years. Jim Miller, 12 years. Dave Davies, 13 years. Sandy Merch, 14 years. Chris Herzberg, 19 years. Mark O'Donnell, 24 years. Ed McDonald, 26 years. Randy Jones, 26 years. Mike Rossi. 27 years. Thank you guys. Thank you very much.